These giant skeletons seem to be evidence. We have to ask ourselves who these seven, eight-foot giants were. As the white settlers made their way to Nevada in conquered North America, they heard the terrifying tales of cannibal giants who once lived in the area. In 1911, giant bones were found in Lovelock Cave, large human skulls and skeletons that measured between seven and eight feet in height. The settlers would fill their imagination with all sorts of horrors until the publication of a book changed everything. And even the legends that proved this was a real story of giants in this area. What followed was a story of a bloodthirsty tribe that was exterminated in the infamous Bat Cave by the Paiutes people. So, what went down? Join us as we explore the world of the giants who almost destroyed America before the conquest, the Thule Eaters. What we know about the Thule Eaters, or the Sitaka tribe, comes from the Paiutes, a Native American tribe that is indigenous to Nebraska and the archaeological discoveries of the modern world. While there's some evidence that the tribe existed and was involved in some sort of warfare, a lot of their history is actually dependent on the Paiutes and their oral tradition. It has been revealed that when the white colonists and settlers began to settle in North America, they had friendly contact with the Paiutes who entertained them with their stories of bravery and courage. After all, they were known to exterminate the giants who roamed in pre-modern North America. This is why the tales surrounding the Sai Te Ka tribes are more of an oral artifact than anything else. The story only became mainstream in 1882 when Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins, daughter of a Paiute Indian chief, detailed the infamous extermination in her book Life Among the Paiutes, Their Wrongs and Claims. So who were these giants who were considered to be a threat to human survivability in North America? Most sources about Setaka describe them as red-haired, white giants or barbarians who were vicious fighters and relentless warmongers. It didn't matter who came up against them or decided to limit their trajectory to acquiring land or food sources. Saiteka would brutally charge at them and finish the job. The tribe itself was described to be unfriendly, so they didn't have any alliances or friendly relations with other indigenous factions in North America. They preferred to travel alone, and forging political and diplomatic ties wasn't their forte at all. Above everything else, they had a unique, callous, and distinctive methodology to win wars and derive their food sources. You see, in most oral traditions, Sitaka were unforgivable cannibals. The tribe's name, which was also called Saiduka, literally translates as Tule Eaters, in the northern Paiute language, the Tule is a fibrous water plant, which, as far as the story goes, was woven by giants into rafts so they could escape attacks by the Paiute. According to the legend, the Sai Te Ka wanted the rafts to navigate across what remained then of Lake La Hontan, an ancient lake that once covered most of northern Nevada during the last ice age. In other sources, tool eaters have a different connotation altogether. A lot of historians who looked at the Paiute language closely reveal that the tribe's name is a direct reference to their diet. Allegedly, the giants would eat the fibrous plant to keep themselves energized. While that could be very much true, there's an alternative story to tell, too. In most oral traditions passed down by the Paiute people, Saite Ka would eat humans, particularly their enemies, as their food. This is why they had earned notoriety in Nevada. They wouldn't win a war against a tribe by using sophisticated tools or tactics. The giants would simply come down to devouring them brutally. Their reign of terror only ended when the Paiute tribe exterminated them on the historical site of the Lovelock Cave. It was the 20th century when archaeologists found thousands of artifacts in the infamous cave. And that's how we were able to find legitimacy in the stories that people like Sarah and other Paiutan descendants have passed down to generations. The Extermination Project 
The lore about the Sitaka tribe and their exterminators is actually pretty black and white. This is why historians have always cast doubt over the Paiutean narrative for centuries. The story starts with the giants, who were known for their war-making, inciting the peaceful, friendly Paiutean tribe into a fight that went down badly. The tradition tells that while Paiute people were expecting a typical fight, the vicious tribe had other plans. The Saite Ka tribe was only able to win because they began to consume their enemies after either killing them or mildly injuring them. While cannibalism wasn't entirely a foreign concept in indigenous tribes, the Paiuchan people were a civilized and organized faction who had more typical ways of hunting and eating. So when they saw how the giants had fared with their people, they were fearful and traumatized. The heinous act of seeing their people ingested alive forced them to retreat to their settlements, and eventually they had to stop fighting the giants. Soon enough, the Site Ka tribe declared their victory and probably celebrated by doing away with more people in a similar ghastly fashion. Now, it's hard to find concrete evidence for this storyline, but most oral traditions suggest the very same. Plus, it is also very difficult to pinpoint the cause of the war that had engulfed the peaceful indigenous tribes of Nevada. Some sources say that the Sitaka tribe was just a fan of war, blood, and chaos. So it was very typical for them to start the fights and end them through very violent means. Their enmity with the Paiuchan tribe also allegedly started with the unprovoked attacks the giants had planned against an otherwise peaceful group of people. But yet again, this particular narrative solely comes from the Paiute people themselves, who had all of the authority to mold the story in their favor. The other cause of war is perhaps the least well known. It is said that while the peaceful tribes were generally tired of the giants spilling blood on their lands, there was no single trigger that caused the big warfare. Paiute people and their fellow factions wanted to exterminate the giants for once, and also there could be peace on their land. They were worried about how their future generations would fare in a Nevada that was ravaged by bloodthirsty people, the Bloody War. What happened was protracted warfare. To defend themselves, the Paiutes joined hands with other peaceful tribes to find a big, bold group of fighters since the giants were lethal in their attacks and methodologies. The so-called peaceful tribes knew that they would need considerable force to take them down. The campaign against the Saite Ka was decisive and brutal. The factions had a lot of small skirmishes and even one-on-one -on -one attacks and duels. Sources reveal that the giants held their ground, too. It's unclear for how long the war waged, but if we look at the intensity of the events, it wasn't a quick affair. The Sitaka were pretty decisive in their warfare, too, but of course, we have all heard that there's strength in numbers. The tribe was habitual of fighting, quick, brutal wars, and leaving the scene quickly. But a war campaign against them meant they had to be drawn out for days, possibly weeks. And it wasn't just viable for the giants who were allegedly used to crunching their enemies instead of fighting with them in good faith. As the war went on, the Sai Te Ka tribe had to retreat to a cave to protect themselves from the relentless attacks of the other factions. It is said that tribes like Paiutes were motivated by revenge. They wanted to bring justice to the loved ones who were brutally slain by the giants. So even when the war took their considerable resources, time, and energy, they didn't want to give up either. But the giants put up a strong fight. This is why the tribal alliance had considered striking up a peace treaty for everyone's prosperity. But guess what? The Sitika tribe, trapped in a cave, refused to sign any doctrine or treaty. They were known to end wars and not settle them. So for them, bowing down in front of their enemies was because they had run out of options. The Paiutian tribe was out of options, too. When the peace treaty was signed, they knew that the giants would come for them sooner or later and that sort of warfare would be a bloody affair. Angered by the persistence of the giants, 
the tribes decided to exterminate their enemies for once and all. The legend goes that the Alliance started a massive blaze at the mouth of the cave by simultaneously hurling sharp weapons and objects at the people inside. There was no escape. Whoever tried to leave the cave was either engulfed by the fire or was simply unalived by the tribes outside. After some time had passed, the Alliance decided to close the mouth of the cave, leaving anyone alive or injured to suffocate and never finding their way out. Were the giants actually cannibalists? By all accounts, the extermination of the giants was gruesome and dark, but the tribes of that time considered it a necessary evil. Narratives from Nevada tell us that the Paiute people and their fellow factions only found peace when the entire race of the Sitaka tribe was wiped out. You see, for years, the giants had also kidnapped the vulnerable and weak of the Paiute tribe for dinner purposes. Loved ones would wake up to see their kin long gone, and even if they tried their best, it was next to impossible to find them. After all, the Saitaka tribe was doing something sinister to them. The archaeological evidence doesn't support this theory so far, but there could be some instances of the giants kidnapping children and women, which must have riled the peaceful tribes even more. The practice of consuming people was always frowned upon by one faction or the other. However, cannibalistic tribes were known to gorge on their enemies for spiritual reasons too. It is believed that these people would indulge in cruel practices to gain special powers and regain their strength after a particularly hard day on the battlefield. While we don't have specific concrete evidence of the Sitae Ka tribe polishing off people, other tribes of their stature have left a considerable mark for historians to consider such narratives as true. So. Yeah, it is not extremely unlikely that the giants never partook of other people. But at the same time, historians warn us about the dangers of the single story. Not to mention, history is merely recorded by the losers. According to popular historical narratives, there's a possibility that Paiute people might have exaggerated the brutality and physical appearance of the giants. For instance, a certain historical source cites that the Paiute traditions could have taken the legends of some slightly taller neighbors that had become extinct and made them out to be terrifying cannibals with crazy red hair coming at you with a dinner knife in order to give reason to the unity of Paiute with other tribes. A lot of historical traditions have seen many tribes coming together to fight a common enemy despite their constant inter-tribe rivalries. If you take a quick glance into the history of North American colonization, you'll see that the tribes would quickly join forces to limit the invasive settlers. And if they weren't fighting the European settlers, they would be battling some other tribe to contest for food sources or even acquiring fertile lands. Plus, a tribal alliance simply meant that you would have more resources for food and personnel. So, what was not to like? All in all, we can't exactly pinpoint the exact motivation behind the extermination mission that the tribes had started. All we can say is that the archaeological evidence has been discovered at the exact site of extermination. To make the story a bit less morally corrupt, we have to consider some other mellow theories too. So far, the Paiutean people were able to establish the belief that the Siteka tribe was this inherently evil force that would eat humans for convenience and spiritual reasons. However, historians who see climate change as one of the biggest indicators of human behavior urge us to consider other possibilities too. What if the giants weren't evil beings who dined on humans for immoral reasons? What if their tall heights and rumor of viciousness had limited their food supply? All of these are big questions that we can't concretely answer, but perhaps looking at the climate patterns of that time gives us some insight. Historians believe that there's a probability that the Siteka tribe suffered through an extreme famine which caused them to engage in depraved acts, including having a peck at other humans. Since the tribe didn't have any alliances, resource sharing was perhaps not an option. 
Maybe the famine passed, but eventually it was too late for the tribe to let go of their barbaric practices. They had simply acquired the taste of human flesh. That sort of deviance popularized them as some savages that tribes like Paiutian had to take out, even if it was by extreme force and depravity, the confusing archaeological evidence. You can probably guess that there are several loose ends in this story. This is perhaps why we should stick to the archaeological evidence that is tied to the story to fill in some logical gaps. Our foremost source of information is the Lovelock Cave, which is known as the Bat Cave today. Located 20 miles south of modern-day Lovelock, Nevada, the cave predates humans and was once underneath Lake Lahontan. It was 1886 when a mining engineer named John Reed first encountered the riveting and bitter rivalry of the two tribes. The local Indians of the Lovelock showed him to the cave as evidence, and that was the first time the infamous site began to garner some archaeological importance. But it would be decades later when two miners, James Hart and David Pugh, would start to dig for guano in the Lovelock area. At that time, guano was very sought out as the ingredient of gunpowder. The two men were only interested in the cave's minerals. For a year or so, they dug around mindlessly to ship a layer of guano to the Hawaiian Fertilizer Company. After digging around 250 tons of guano, the duo found some old artifacts in the mining site. They were so intrigued that they immediately contacted Alfred Krober, who was the founder of the University of California Anthropology Department. It was 1912 when L.L. L. Loud of the same college began the excavation process. By the year 1929, Loud had published a report about his findings that left the historians shocked and mesmerized. According to the report, Loud's team had stumbled upon 10,000 archaeological specimens, including tools, bones, baskets, and guess what? Weapons. The archaeologists found 60 average-height mummies that were a product of a proper burial process. And wait, there's more. The historians also believe that whoever inhabited the cave was ahead of the curve in one way or another. The archaeologists found a donut-shaped stone with three 65 notches carved outside the stone, while 52 corresponding notches were carved inside. And this could possibly mean one thing. The inhabitants had their own calendar. The team also found duck decoys and a sandal in the cave. Archaeologists believe that the Lovelock cave culture was eventually overtaken by the northern Paiutes. But here's the catch. Even the archaeological venture around the area is plagued with speculation and rumors. Historians believe that the team had found concrete proof of the Paiutean story, when there were reports of mummified remains being found of two red-haired giants. Allegedly, the woman's mummy was 6.5 feet tall, and the male body was over 8 feet tall. However, over time, such claims were either discarded or lost to the excavation process. Archaeologists believe that the stories of calling Saite Ka people giants is perhaps another hyperbolic act. You see, even Sarah Winnemucca in her book didn't call the tribal people giants, but rather barbarians. Not to mention, a lot of historical research of the area suggests that even the tallest beings were about six feet tall, and there's little evidence of people being as tall as eight feet in Nevada. Maybe the male mummy was a one-off exception, that too, if it existed. But all hope is not lost. For many historians, the discovery of a 15-inch sandal at the cave is substantial proof that there were giants that had to be exterminated, and maybe then the Paiute tale is real. Others believe that perhaps archaeologists were looking at the wrong place. This is why another stride was made in 1931 when two very large skeletons were found in the Humboldt Dry Lake bed around the Lovelock area. One of the skeletons was 81 feet tall, while the other was 10 feet tall. Yet the wrapping of the skeletons in gum-covered fabric meant that the ancient dead got a proper burial. 
and it is likely that the riverbed was a personal graveyard of some sort for the giant family. Now, there's other sketchy evidence that has been found in the cave, too, including giant hand prints that were discovered in 2013. However, it is very hard to find any validity in those discoveries. Not to mention, the existence of the giants themselves doesn't prove that the tale of the infamous warfare is true. But deep archaeological missions might tell us something about the cannibalistic nature of the giants, or maybe not. A lot of evidence is open to interpretation. However, the archaeologists were able to recover some human bones from the cave, even though the evidence is very sparse. This is to say that the bones do suggest that perhaps a human was devouring the flesh off them, but we can't put a story into the practice as of now. It is unclear if the inhabitants of the cave were doing this to each other in times of acute food shortage, or if someone had entered the site to specifically consume the dead or the feeble people trapped inside. We also have to consider that perhaps the peaceful tribes weren't as effective at their extermination project as they had claimed to be. Maybe someone was left alive and was forced to ingest their own kin to survive. These are pretty grim possibilities, but at the same time, such questions allow us to dig deep into the stories that are passed on by the victors. What we can say is that there was a time in American history when the giants roamed freely in the land we now call Nevada. But were they as vicious as the Paiutes had made them to be? We can't possibly know. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.